Hi out there, I'm Mac. Mac stands for Me and Citizens Forum. I have been on the quest to find Citizens Forum and its founder. Before I begin, I would like to thank all of the volunteers here tonight. There's uh, Sebastian Schimek, did I get that correct, Sebastian? Talia Wilson, Will Smith, Ben Kerr, Alan Dong, King Kim Robinson, of course, and John McKenzie is not here today, and uh, also Kim Robinson is here. And I'm here. I'm on the quest for Citizens Forum. Me and Citizens Forum. Are you out there, audience? Are you watching Shaw? Are you watching for a little closer? I'm post New Year's. That's what I am today. I'm a work in progress also. It keeps changing. So Citizens Forum, that's a quest I've been on for some time. Who founded Citizens Forum? I found this article, news media, the old Monday magazine. And it's called Making New Media. And Jack has a few words to say. Quote and unquote. I hope I do you justice, Jack. Over in TV land, local activist Jack Etkin has been running independent community television on Shaw TV, capitalizing on CRTC regulations that require community television stations to help the required community time. He says, and here's the quote, well, I better not quote that quote. It's expletive. So here we are. Oh, I found something, folks. The bridge. I remember the bridge. The print is very small, but it's got everything in it. Ah, the bridge. Teddy Horlack told me about the bridge. And there's been many inter interesting guests on here. Uh, Jessica Ernest. Liquid Natural Gas, John Farquharson, uh, Vic Derman, uh, he passed last year, uh, Christina Nikolic, uh, Rick Hapgood. Oh, congratulations, Rick, for all the work you did on proportional voting. Natalie Chambers, Madrona Farms, she says farmlands are at risk. Kelvin Cook, Tammy Jeske, a nurse. Her son has uh, electromagnetic sensitivity. And oh my goodness, I'm done. Oh, one more thing. The Civic Collection 2008. And that's in the Megaphone magazine. And Kim Robinson has something coming out on that sometime in January. And uh, there's a couple of quotes here. Am I done? I have one minute left. I love this. Ah, where is that? Yeah, there was an excellent quote. Will Smith, highest form of activism is observing. We are going through the birth canal, leaving one system for another. Oh, darling, don't you love that? Going through the birth canal, leaving one system and going to another. I love that, darlings. Well. Uh, are we closing? Uh, I have my little Tinker Bell. Jack says I can just go on as long as I want. Yes, yes, Matt, yes. Your time is up. Oh no, no, it can't be. I came all this way from the North Pole and got all dressed. I'm not going peacefully. <laughs> Welcome back. It is. Uh, Thursday, January the 3rd. Um, our guest in the first segment is Elizabeth Woodworth, and we're going to be talking about two very important issues. The first is 9-11, and the second is climate change. So Elizabeth, you have 
a new book out, um, The Findings of an International Review Panel that has investigated 9-11 for seven years. And I just had a look at the book. It looks eminently readable more than anything else, which is great. Well, that's good news. Thank you, Jack. Yes, uh, this book came out in September of 2018, and the title is 9-11 Unmasked, an International Review Panel Investigation. Um, it's been doing, selling very well on Amazon in the United States. And it's the report of uh, the 23-member 9-11 consensus panel after its seven years of work, which started in 2011. So a 23-member 9-11 consensus, consensus panel that's been working on this issue for seven, seven years. years. Okay. That's right. And uh, the panelists include physicists, uh, chemists, engineers, former NASA uh, researchers, pilots, uh, an aircraft crash investigator, journalists, and lawyers. So we've got a really professional panel. And we used a best evidence consensus model to evaluate 51 of the official claims about 9-11. Uh, claims that were made by the White House first and then by the fraudulent 9-11 uh, commission report, which Harper's Magazine described as whitewash in 2004. And then repeated, all those claims were then repeated ad nauseum by the media as if they were true. The, indeed. So the and public was given this message. That's right. That's the story. So we refuted all these claims in eight different areas. The Twin Tower attacks, World Trade Center 7, which was a uh, okay, 47. How did you refute, if, if I can butt, butt in, how did you refute the? Uh, well, we each claim was uh, written up the, in, in terms of the best evidence, first the official claim, then the best evidence that we could find, and then the conclusion. And we, David Griffin and I, would send these, our write-ups, uh, um, analyzing each claim, out to these 23 panelists and they would have a week or two to review them and send their feedback, which we would then incorporate, and we'd send it out a second time, get the feedback again, and after the third time, we usually had 85% consensus. And this is the same model that's used in medicine worldwide to, uh, to develop uh, medical consensus statements that are then announced in the media. They're considered to be the best evidence in medicine. So we use that model. So this is why this is kind of groundbreaking about 9-11. And um, we divided these, these um, official claims into the Twin Towers, World Trade Center 7, Pentagon, the, the flights themselves, the four flights, um, the US military exercises that were being run that morning. Um, all the major US annual military exercises were being run on 9-11 in the morning, which is unheard of because they were normally run in October and in April, and they were, we have proof that they were actually moved. So that created immense um, confusion. Chaos. Yeah. Um, there were claims about eight of the top um, military and political leaders, like Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, and the military generals. Um, generally, that, that, that they were absent. That was the 9-11 the, the Commission and the White House tried to to show that these people were all basically not at their stations, but they were. And, uh, and then there was uh, Osama bin Laden and the hijackers. We looked into all the claims about them. And uh, the phone calls from the flights turned out to be impossible at, at the high elevations. So the phone calls that were reported that as were having re come from you, your group says it's impossible for those phone calls to have taken place. That's right, and the FBI even acknowledged that itself. Like, because of tel cell phone technology, it doesn't work above about 10,000 feet. So, and we should just mention for a moment the immense disasters that have come out of 9-11, not only the thousands of people who were murdered on that day, mm -hmm. but the wars that followed, the destruction of Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya and Syria, the creation mm -hmm. of millions of refugees that have, are now destabilized in Europe in some ways. I mean, all of that came out of 9-11, and you know, if you want to know why 9-11 happened, that's, those are the reasons I think 9-11 happened. What was some of the ev most important evidence that you discovered? Well, the most important evidence uh, includes the overwhelming evidence that the Twin Towers in Building 7 were brought to straight down at freefall speed into their own footprints. And there's only one way to do that, 
and that's controlled demolition. And the news anchors that very morning were saying, this looks like controlled demolition. But soon that all disappeared from the internet. Okay, so your group of experts, and I mean, I, I find you to be a very reasonable, rational person with a great background. Uh, Mr. Mr. Griffin, your co-author, I think has an international reputation. I have a feeling the other people involved, in, I mean, are they people with, are they just people off the street? Are they experts? Are they? No, they're mostly academics. Okay. We have, yeah. And their consensus is that the buildings, the Twin Towers and Building 7, were brought down by controlled demolition. That's on right. The several engineers. And, uh, of course, there's the en architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth Group, run by an architect since 2006. 3,000 of these architects and engineers are calling for a new investigation into 9-11. We have 3,000 architects and engineers in the United States who are saying that the official story is impossible, that the buildings were not brought down by being struck by airplanes. But it doesn't matter because none of this is allowed to be in the media. That's the power that we're up against. So can you give us another example of something? Yes. Uh, uh, the official story claimed that many of the top U.S. military and political leaders could not be found that morning. But our investigation shows they were present. Uh, this points to 9-11 being a false flag attack. And that's where you attack yourself and then you blame it on the person that you actually, or the country that you actually want to invade. And that was the case uh, with the Gulf of Tonkin in Vietnam that started that war. So 9-11 was most likely planned, or at least allowed, by these top people, including the neocons, Vice President Cheney, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, the Assistant Secretary of Defense, Paul Wolfe Wolfowitz, uh, and um, uh, to trigger the global war on terror in the Middle East. So these guys, immediately after 9-11, they started promoting uh, the war in Iraq. And uh, the 9-11 wars have kept the far more serious issue of climate change out of the headlines ever since 2001. So that... So you've also... I mean, I agree that climate change is, a, is of nightmarish importance. And uh, so you've also written a book about climate change. This past year. And, uh, and actually, uh, the title of this book is Unprecedented Crime, Climate Science Denial, and Game Changers for Survival. So it offers solutions as well as the, the uh, proof of the crime. And uh, I took the book to the last climate change uh, conference in, in um, Germany last year, and I found Dr. James Hansen, who's the best known climate scientist on the planet, and I showed him the book and asked him if he would write the foreword. And he said, well, I don't usually write forewords, but I'll let you know, and he did decide to write it. So which puts the book into a league that it should be selling, uh, but it's actually not, because the mainstream media doesn't really want us to know the solutions to climate change. It's okay to talk about extreme weather and that climate change is happening, but the solutions that are happening worldwide, we're not getting them in our media. Okay, what are some? Um, well, um, we devote several chapters to things like smart buildings, um, uh, smart windows, which you can coat and you, you can get much a lot more energy through these windows. Smart buildings uh, means? Uh, they're just designed to, to, to uh, conserve energy, to draw energy from the, the uh, exterior uh, ambience. And like, we don't hear about these things. They're, no. they're, well, our book gives several chapters to, I should hold it up. Um, this is the book, Unprecedented Crime. Good. And uh, uh, we, we look, uh, energy storage is very, very important, which is allowing intermittent things like, like uh, solar and wind energy to, to be conserved overnight and not to be interrupted. There's wonderful oh, new so batteries, battery storage. Battery storage. Um, ocean energy, uh, small hydro projects for farms, uh, 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 rural um, farms and other enterprises. And um, uh, I have more here. Geothermal energy. Here's something that most Canadians should know uh, and the Canadian media never mentions is that in Alberta, there are 60,000 old uh, oil, oil wells that 
at the bottom of them are is geothermal energy, and they could be using that. They could up, be uploading that energy to a smart grid, an interconnected grid across Canada. Um, the Trudeau government could be financing a smart grid, and it could be transferring the subsidies that it gives to oil companies now, which he promised he would stop doing, but he's still giving them massive subsidies. And those subsidies could be conditional upon the oil companies transitioning to renewable energy at the rate of 10% a year. And then we could meet Canada's target to, uh, to be fully renewable by 2050, which there are experts uh, that are not covered in the mainstream media, like uh, Dr. Mark Jacobson at the Stanford Solutions Project uh, in California. He has provided a roadmap for all, almost all the countries in the world on how to get to zero carbon by 2050. And he, he actually has the solutions. And many of the cities, and 100 cities in the United States have declared that they're going to be um, zero carbon by then using these solutions. But we're not hearing about this in the media. What are a couple of those, a couple of other of those things that, I mean, to me, it seems like we should immediately be moving towards public transit and mass transit and away from cars of any kind. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's not, well, not difficult to do, but we seem unable to do it. The problem is that um, the global, uh, the top eight of the top 10 global Fortune 500 companies are fossil fuel and automotive. And they buy all the, the advertising in the media. So the media is discouraged from telling us. Not only buy the advertising, they're the companies who own the media. That's I mean, right. They're all locked together. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, just, it's a Bell Media, which owns CTV and CFAX here in Victoria. The chairman of the board of the company that owns Bell Media is the former CEO of the Royal Bank, which is totally invested into fossil fuels and everything else. So their job is to tell yeah. us that everything's okay. Yeah, maybe things will be, I mean, our, our, our lives are in danger. Our children's lives are in mortal peril. But you'd never know it by listening no, you wouldn't to know the it. media. So the society's response is being hampered. And, and, and the, this book, Unprecedented Crime, goes into all the avenues that you've just mentioned, the, the banks, the governments, the, the companies themselves that have discouraged, um, just like the tobacco companies did in the 60s. Yeah. They've, their PR uh, units have yeah, been there doing There really is an unprecedented crime, you know? I mean, it's... It, the future of the entire, not only humans, but everything is being put at risk because these people just can't stop taking more and more and more. It's total insanity. And, and at the same time, denying us the, the information and the understanding that we need to take action ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Ah. So we've only got a minute left. Do you think that uh, how are 9-11 and climate change denial, climate science denial, uh, connected. I'm just looking into this now, but um, Dick Cheney is kind of a key pin in this. Uh, he, he had an energy task force going early in 2001. And at that time, uh, they developed a map of the Iraqi uh, pipelines and oil fields dated March 2001. So we have that proof that they were looking at Iraq then, six months before 9-11. And he has always been uh, a, a climate denialist. So our, this book, the 9-11 the, uh, uh, Unmasked, shows how Cheney was involved in 9-11. So we have these two things coming together. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the going into Iraq for, for uh, denying climate science so they, c they can continue to use oil forever yeah. and at the same time setting it up yeah. so that they can get into the Middle East. Elizabeth Watertown, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Two of the most important issues in the world. Good luck to all, us, uh, all of us in solving them. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. It's uh, January the 3rd, Thursday. Uh, in this segment, Will and I, Walter's on holiday, Will and I are going to be talking to Hendrik de Pachter about proportional representation, the BC Clean Plan, and uh, I think the Green Party's role in the coalition government. Hendrik is a former child protection uh, social worker 
and an in-hospital social worker, so he's seen a lot of stuff. Uh, so, Hendrik, you want to start off with PR? Well, first of all, I'd like to say oh. Happy New Year, Jack, Happy and congratulations on another year of a Citizens Forum. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy well, New Year. Yeah, I, I had three thoughts about uh, proportional representation, or the result, rather, that uh, I'd be happy to hear uh, the two of you weigh in on. And the first is that uh, clearly, as it happened with uh, particularly the 2009 uh, STV referendum, is that money and uh, the media had a determining influence on the outcome of, uh, the, um, of the referendum. I want to say up front and frankly that I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not really disappointed about the result in as much as I expected it. And I expected it a year ago and I, I gathered some unfavorable looks when I said as much to uh, the colleagues that I confer with about these things. So uh, we see the same pattern as in 2009 when, uh, when uh, industry, uh, capital, uh, and government interests united to oppose the STV referendum. And the contrast between the 2005 and 2009 referendums are quite striking, a question of almost 20% in the shift in, uh, in the decision of uh, British Columbians not to support uh, some kind of proportional representation. The, uh, the media campaign closely coordinated with the Liberal Party was replete with uh, falsities. Uh, chief of them were that this was a way for the NDP to keep the Green Party uh, sown uh, uh, by its side and continue their uh, supply and confidence motion. And really uh, what is uh, not uh, understood is that the Green Party historically, not only in Canada but all around the world, has had participatory democracy and in particular proportional representation as an aspect of that since its beginning. So this is not some quixotic new quest by the Green Party to gain power because 16 percent of the a vote or 17 percent of the vote in the last provincial election should have gained something like 12 or 13 seats. Instead, uh, we got three and a half percent of the seats, three seats. So there is a clear uh, uh, discrimination in that process. And uh, the uh, Green Party really gained traction in those countries in Europe where there is proportional representation, particularly in Europe, in, in Germany. So to say that this was a ploy by the Green Party to gain power, no, it's in the, it's in the DNA of the Green Party to advocate for participatory democracy and proportional representation. The second concern <coughs> that I had was that the big players in the NDP uh, were really strongly opposed to proportional representation. The one exception, and, and I believe he does deserve credit, is John Horgan. He had a conversion experience in 2009 uh, when he saw the result. And he, he worked quite hard for proportional representation, but I can't really think of any other NDP stalwarts who were really slugging it out uh, in the fields trying to Hendrick, attract that, that vote. This is the one place where I disagree with you, where I would disagree with sure, you, because I don't think John Horgan did anything. He's mm -hmm. the premier of the province. He has total control of the government. And the government did nothing to explain to people how the systems work and answer the public's questions. People had so many questions, and a lot of people felt a lot of people felt so uninformed that they didn't even feel they could vote. And from well, what well, I saw, I'm going to take John you to task and on the that. NDP did nothing. I'm going to take you to task on that, and yeah. I'm going to take the voters of BC to task on that. Uh, where the Liberal Party and the media were very successful was in saying this is a complicated procedure. This is super complicated. Uh, if you cannot spend two hours to study the various options and to study the question of proportional representation versus first past the post, why do you want a democracy if you cannot spend two hours to study these matters? I found all kinds of information. Uh, that it's available. The government certainly could have done a better job. I agree with your comments that I saw on Facebook that this process of information should have been much more robust a year ago 
There's no question of that. And I'd like to go back to the fact that the NDP leadership, uh, Glenn Clark, uh, Mike Harcourt, Dave Barrett in his day, uh, uh, Ujjal Dosanjh, these guys all opposed uh, proportional representation, as did uh, Bill Tielemann, famous NDP apparatchik, who had to get out of the party in order to, or stop working for the party in order to advocate no for proportional representation. Okay, I'll just say I spent more than two hours looking through stuff and I got no idea. Mm -hmm. The only way I got an idea was because I happened to know somebody who knew the systems and they explained it to me. All right. When I went looking, I could not find the information. That, that would explain anything to me. Ooh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, I, I, my, my take on this is that uh, everyone who really wanted to could study these questions. And what I'm shocked about is that people came up with this, oh, it's too complicated, again and again and again, as if uh, there aren't complicated matters in life that have to be delved into. Uh, I think democracy is worth the two hours. And, and the third thing that really concerned me about the referendum is something that you have been diligent about, and that is uh, we used voting machines. We didn't use the gold standard of counting by hand. And that really means that the whole election is really subject to uh, whether or not we trust these machines. And you've done some research, very interesting research, which suggests that the owners of the, uh, of the firm which did uh, the counting by machine is owned by disreputable groups who already are tied in with Diebold, etc. And maybe you can <laughs> expound on that, uh, Jack. Well, there is a connection between some, I would say, very shady, very large corporations and uh, the company that provided us with the voting machines. I've asked Elections BC uh, who programmed the machines, and I've asked Elections BC uh, what kind of a hand count they did just to ensure that there's some validity to the machine count. That's all. I've gotten no answers. Mm -hmm. It's been mm -hmm. a week, no answer. And they're very simple questions. They're very simple questions, and, uh, and I appreciate that, that you are asking them. They need to be answered. And this is January 3rd, so it's, yeah. that, you know, right. that's where we are. And, and the concern is, if we can have a vote, a referendum, where the gold standard of hand counting is not applied, then we're opening up the door to all kinds of elections being counted by machine and not being checked by hand counting. We need hand counting as the gold standard in this democracy and we're slipping into the American system of relying on Diebold-like uh, machinery to determine who, uh, who really won. And you've asked the question to this company who programmed the machine. I asked Elections BC. That's right. You've asked Elections BC who programmed this. So I think that those are very important questions. So reluctance by the leadership of the NDP, the use of machines, and the fact that money and capital have control over the media and determine how people see uh, the question of proportional representation. Clearly, I, I, ha I watched Andrew Wilkinson try to explain the defaults of proportional representation, and I had to stop after three or four minutes because everything he said was a lie, demonstrably a lie. But the so, media, but nor the, the NDP but ever the, called but him he's on. not challenged. He's not systematically challenged. And indeed, the Vancouver Sun and the Times Colonist both wrote uh, editorials opposing uh, proportional representation. And I think it will be ever thus. I think the cause is lost here in BC until the Supreme Court of Canada says in 2076 that BC you will have proportional representation. In fact, I don't even know if I want to vote again because I don't know if I want to participate in a system which takes my vote and then throws it into the garbage and says you do not have a right to have representation in the legislature. And so I'm wondering why I should participate at all. I, I, uh, I totally get what you're saying there, and I, I feel to some extent the same way because as a new Canadian, this is only the second election that I voted in, and I voted in the municipal election, and then I voted in the PR. And uh, just seeing this result, I, I wonder how much of the result is, uh, first of all, people don't want to participate in the system because they don't believe in it. And I mean, we've seen that on the show. We've seen people who 
used to believe in the system and who no longer believe in the system. And I can't really blame them because um, the, in, in interpersonal relationships, this kind of thing is called gaslighting and there, there are consequences to being mm -hmm. gaslighted. It's not something, you can't just say, oh, you know, they, they fooled me again. You can't, you can't say that forever, the site C dam. I mean, that in particular comes up. So I, I totally understand what you're saying and I kind of wonder, well, maybe this brings to light uh, the system people are not voting because they don't believe in it or people want to stay with the first past the post because th they don't want it to change. They just want everything to be okay. And to, if we just keep on the path that we're on, it's probably going to be okay. I think there's a lot of fear there and a lot of unknown because things are so crazy now that there's some uh, tendency that people want to just hold on. But that's what I, what I want to do before we get worried about uh, being able to whether our votes are worth anything, I would like to take an assessment of each of us personally who live in this type of society where we're continually being lied to by politicians and say, how has this affected our mental health? I mean, I agree with you that we're not going to see proportional representation <laughs> until sometime in the distant future. Mm -hmm. So how much time should I spend researching something that's just going to be, it's just going to be lied about? I mean, how much for my own mental health. I really do think that that's a serious concern. And I think that I, the last guest, Elizabeth, is showing us the stuff that was done mm -hmm. to us in 9-11. These are tactics that are used to control people. I mean, the, the tactics of, of uh, lying to people and not giving them what they, <laughs> what they vote for. These are, these are known tactics, right? Hendrik, how about if we move on to sure. something else you wanted to talk about, which is the BC Clean Plan, well, which when you mentioned yeah. it, Will and I both said, what's that? Right? Well, that's the clean plan that was announced, I think, in early December uh, with great fanfare by uh, the NDP and uh, the Green Party. I received uh, a number of uh, emails from the Green Party <laughs> basically lauding the BC Clean Plan, and I was really quite thoroughly disgusted with it. Uh, we're supposed to move to zero emission vehicles by 2040 when Norway is able to do this by 2025, Holland by 2030, Germany by 2030, India by 2030. And we're going to wait till 2040 to get to zero emission vehicles. There's no mention of solar energy, uh, wind energy, the geothermal potential that your previous guest mentioned. Uh, the, the geothermal potential in BC alone is enough to provide all of our electricity. So uh, I, there's nothing about reforestation or deforestation or the fact that old growth forests uh, are, are the best sequesters of carbon going. So uh, there was a lot there and what I saw from the Green Party was a lot of cheering on of a plan that looks like to me to have quite a few flaws and that is saying we'll get to 80 percent reduction of greenhouse gases by 2050 when the IPCC and other organizations are telling us we'll be dead if that's what we achieve. So you also wanted to talk a little bit about the Green Party's role in what's going on with the Well, I'm government. concerned that with the BC Clean Plan, what I see is a lot of praise and laudatory commentary on the part of the Green Party leadership. What Weaver did complain about is that after 2030, uh, the uh, projected expansion of LNG would violate the, the plan in terms of arriving at the 80 percent reduction by 2050. That's his sole criticism. He's been mostly praiseworthy. The responses I got back to my emails back to the Green Party were basically justifying their decisions and saying there's going to be more stuff. But I don't hear a balance between lauding what is achieved, uh, and it is an impressive plan compared to the paucity of good plans in Canada, uh, and what we really need to do to survive. There is still a difference between what they're proposing, which is better, and survival. And I don't see them achieving that. So I'm pissed off. <laughs> We're going to have to leave it at being pissed off. Uh, <laughs> thanks we'll again. We'll come, ba come back on shortly and we'll finish this off. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for watching this segment of Citizenship. <laughs>
and it's a, a march uh, from the library downtown to, uh, to the provincial courthouse. It has to do with the $40 billion liquefied natural gas plan that John Horgan and the NDP have, and the Liberals, have for this province, uh, which involves massive amounts of fracking and massive destruction of our fresh water. Um, a part of this is they have to build a pipeline from eastern BC across to, I think, Kitimat, where, uh, where they're going to build a, a huge port where these LNG super tankers can come in. The Unistotan people, whose land the pipeline will go across, have been blockading it for years. Um, but now everything is moving to a head. Uh, the, the NDP have given approval, and I believe the companies want to start work. Uh, the Unistotan camp is there. The, uh, the corporations sought an injunction in December uh, to have the camp removed. That's what this little march is about. And uh, the injunction was confirmed. The courts gave the corporations the injunction so they can remove the camp. This happened in late December. As far as I know, the camp is still there. They're fighting for all of us. Because if this crazy fracking LNG plan goes ahead, we're even deader than we are now. So, thank you very much. No court injunctions on stolen native land. We stand with Unistoten. We stand with Unistoten. We stand with Unistoten. We stand with Unistoten. No court injunctions on stolen native land. No court injunctions on stolen native land. Unistoten heals. Coast of Gas Lake steals. Coast of Gas Lake steals. So I acknowledge the Lekwungen-speaking people's territory, acknowledge the work that their ancestors have done to take care of this land, and not acknowledge the work their families have always done to take care of this land. Um, indigenous people, uh, we've inherited laws of the lands that we are born in to take care of the land. Welcome back. It's uh, January the 3rd. I'd like to start by thanking our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this show happen every couple of weeks. My guest in this segment is Chris Cook. Chris is the host of Guerrilla Radio on CFUV and uh, also the editor of PacificFreePress.com. Yeah, that's right, John. So, Chris, we're going to talk about a few different things, and we're going to start with the arrest of the lady who is the daughter of the owner of Huawei. Uh, <laughs> her name, I think, is Meng Wanzhou. Um, and I don't remember her position with Huawei, but uh, I know she was arrested in Canada. In Vancouver. Time. Well, it's uh, Meng Wanzhou. And, uh, but before we get to that, Jack, I just want to uh, sort of shout out to your previous guests uh, uh, about the referendum. You know, uh, the, uh, I, too, was watching that very closely, uh, the electoral reform, and was very surprised that the, all the polling before that referendum went said it was a dead heat. Yeah. And yet, it was quite one-sided, I thought, 60-40, roughly, uh, on the night. So I phoned up a couple of those polling companies and asked them if they were surprised that there was such a disparity between their polling mm -hmm. And, uh, and the actual results. Only one of them got back to me and did say that they were very surprised. They didn't think it was, there was a nefarious, sinister hand behind it. But they were surprised, but even more so surprised. Uh, they were embarrassed because their own polling was so far off the mark. But they were very surprised too that their two competitors had virtually the same results. The fact that they'd all said that this was pretty much a dead heat and all of them were proven wrong. So uh, just to throw that little bit of extra out there, but as um, uh, Hendrik was saying that the, the gold standard is counting, you know, paper ballots hand counted. And I've been doing research. Uh, there's a woman in the States named Jennifer Cohn who's been working on, you know, against machine vote counting for a long time. She's at um, uh, hashtag paper ballots now. And a lot of the information applies to us in Canada because there's very few of these companies running it. 
Dominion, uh, uh, who was the company supplying the machines in the referendum, is actually a Canadian company that was uh, bought from an American company affiliated with Diebold, famous for the George uh, W. Bush election back in 2000. Now they're partnered up with a, a New York-based um, uh, equities company of some description. Uh, but um, yeah, so there's there's all of this, and I would have loved to got in on your table. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, Greg Palast, of course, is another guy that uh, uh, down in the states, a journalist who's been following the rigged votes ever since George Bush's election uh, selection in 2000, and he's still at it, and which comes into play here later as well. Now, the arrest in Vancouver. Now, you're seeing already now what's happening because of the, uh, the Huawei executive. She's the uh, chief financial officer, daughter of the founder of the company. This Huawei uh, company is massive in China. It's like, you know, Apple. I asked somebody uh, that I interviewed about this recently, Peter Lee. Uh, he has a website uh, called China Watch. And I asked him, well, what, how would you relate the arrest of, of Meng Wanzhou in the context of if she was an American? You know? I said, well, you know, who would it be like arresting? And he posited that, well, imagine if Bill Gates went to China and the Chinese arrested Melinda Gates and put her in jail and sent Bill home. This is what it would be like, the, the equivalent. In China, this is a huge outrage, a massive outrage. And if Canadians wonder why there's been these other arrests and, and tisk tisk that they're retaliatory, well, uh, you know, you play with fire, you get burned, you know? She must have felt that she was quite safe because she, she wasn't coming to Canada. She was flying to Mexico, I think. It was and a three I guess flight. she was yeah. changing planes. Did she, not, did she not have any indication or did the Chinese government not have any indication? Because, I mean, all of this is known. Well, the United States has these things about Iran. and Right. I mean, it must have come out of the blue. They're a very big company, Huawei. They've got a lot of money. They've got a lot of lawyers. And they've got a representation from a huge law firm in the United States that goes over, just specifically goes over these very issues to make sure that they are, you know, in compliance with everything because they don't want trouble with their business. With the United States is a huge market for any company, no matter how big. And they, they don't want to make waves, you know, generally. So then why did this happen? They thought that they were safe. Um, in a broader sense, uh, the United States' um, sanctions against Iran are not legal in an international sense I to mean, begin with. To begin with, yeah. They're not uh, legal under Canadian law either. The, the fact that our government recognized these is, is doubly troubling because, you know, internationally these are not legal sanctions and by Canadian law, I talked to a Canadian international law um, lawyer, Christopher Black, about this very issue, uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago. And um, so there was no reason for her to think that... I find that it a little bit strange that we, the Canadian people, have not been told that our government and the United States government is kind of dabbling in illegalities here. Do you? No, I don't <laughs> actually come to think of it. But isn't it strange that this arrest takes place? We're told, you know, this is international law. Canada's yeah. a law-abiding nation. We, it's all in the courts. We're a rule of law nation yeah. is, is, the, uh, is the phraseology that's, you know, gaining and all yet of it. There it's are the opposite. It, in true Orwellian form, this is the opposite. We are not a rule of nation, a rule of law nation in this regard. We are not obeying our own laws, Canadian laws. We're not obeying international laws. This is an entirely political event. And essentially, the Americans have put us out on the line here. And I imagine that Christia Freeland and Mr. Trudeau are not pleased at all with the Americans and, and the position they've put us in. Um, and not just us. If you look at Apple, uh, their, their sales numbers have tanked uh, in China. And their CEO, Cook, uh, Tim Cook, was out the other day saying, oh, well, it's the economy in China it, you know, is the reason why. No, it's not the, the economy in China. is that the Chinese aren't going to buy Apple phones now. They're all going to buy Huawei because th this company is hugely important to them. You know? And, and they, they're outraged. So. So we wait to see what will come of that. You wanted to talk about 
something I don't know anything about, the Institute for Statecraft Integrity Initiative yeah. and its journalist clusters. Can I say that again? The Institute for Statecraft Integrity Initiative yeah. And it's journalist. This is this is breaking academic. big, and this is out of the UK, but it has international uh, ramifications. the The Institute for Statecraft is on its face a charity, and uh, it's been funded to um, the mostly by NATO and the British government. It turns out, though, that they are a, a cutout, a front for um, a spy operation, essentially. The Integrity Initiative is one, is one of their many programs. And, um, you know, with this arrest, again, with the Meng Wanzhou, the, counter, the counteract and w arrests of the Canadian Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, right? They're the two Canadians. These are, are the two right? Canadians that are held. Now, Michael Kovrig works for an outfit called the International Crisis Group. It's an NGO that is concerned with peace in the world, and this is their sort of plate. Michael Kovrig himself has a resume uh, as a journalist, as he was a diplomat in Canada. He's actually still considered a Canadian diplomat on leave, and then he's working for this international crisis group, going around, based in Hong Kong, but going out throughout China, and especially dealing, talking to people about China and Korea, China, Korea, North Korean relations. Um, Michael Spavor is a his his business is taking people into Korea into North Korea. He's got a lot of cross border connections. That's the commonality between these two guys. They've both been regarded as spies by the Chinese. The reason I mention this is that it, we get into this murky world where non government organizations, NGOs, and spy craft and journalists come, diplomats come, NGO operatives, all start to intermingle and, and interchange and it becomes very fuzzy. With this um, integrity initiative, now you got to forgive me because I'm just getting into this and this is next week's program, you know, <laughs> but uh, what they've, they, these clusters of journalists, they've gone on, they've recruited from the business, they've recruited in the media, They've recruited a number of different people to campaign online, to basically control information flow on the internet, to create um, perceptions. I'll read you a little, a little something here. This Kit, uh, Kit Klarenberg is a, um, a journalist for Sputnik, a, a Russian, a Russian uh, media outlet. And he, but here I'm quoting from the actual Integrity Initiative's own webpage, their self-description, they say that the initiative is amassing clusters the world over, groups of politicians, business people, military officials, academics, and journalists who understand the threat posed to Western nations by Russian disinformation and can be mobilized to influence policy in support of the Anglo-Saxon worldview. This is what's going on, and these are not these journalists, for example, they're getting from places like The Guardian, and they've got these journalists writing for them. One of the things that came out was, you've seen the way Jeremy Corbyn has been attacked, savaged, by the UK press. No, I haven't. I've just heard about it, but I haven't, you it's know. It's been an unrelenting attack yeah, against Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn, right. and they've, you know, leader put Leader of the Labour they've Party. Put, he's, the, he's the leader we of the opposition. Liked, he's the leader yeah. of the opposition, and most likely to become the Prime Minister. Uh, Theresa May is, you know, is terribly unpopular, yeah. you know, and the Brexit thing is a disaster. So, it, you know, it would, it's not uh, unfathomable that uh, Corbyn would take over. They don't want this. They don't want this happening. When you say they, you mean? Well, the power, these guys at the initiative, but the powers that be in the, the media, the, in yeah. business, all of these guys in the military that they mobilize together, as they say so succinctly here, would, they don't want to see Corbyn in, you know. But, uh, and, and you've seen even outfits like the BBC, they put, them, uh, they put pictures of Corbyn with like a Russian hat on and yeah. with, the, with the hammer the and sickle is, in the background. Well, the and, the and, too, and the Guardian too. Yeah. You know, the, one of the people outed in this leaked, you know, it was the anonymous group um, that leaked this integrity initiative um, document about three months ago. It, it took a while, it took a couple months to sort of really break the surface even after the leak. 
Um, but one of the journalists that they out is a, is a, a marquee Guardian uh, journalist named uh, Carol Codwallader. You might remember, you remember the guy Chris Wiley with the Cambridge Analytica and this whole thing about Facebook. And yeah, yeah. this was last, last year's. Well, it turns out, and he was from Victoria, this Chris right. Wiley guy. Well, it turns out that he had been coached by Carol Codwallader for a year before making this great presentation that caused uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook so much, at Facebook rather, so much consternation, you know. The point being here, Jack, is that the, the, there's these forces underneath that are very worried about the internet and the flow of information and they're Moving infiltrating. To, yes. There's more, there's much more to this as well. It gets to this whole Russian bot thing and the, the CEO of LinkedIn who gets, you know, implicated in doing exactly more, the same we're thing. we're not going to hear it. Yeah, I'm well, there's always time. more, Jack. Chris, that was fascinating. <laughs> thank you so much. And more to come, I hope. Please. Anyways, thank you, Chris, and thank you for watching this segment of Citizen Talk. <laughs>